see everyone today. It feels, well, it's been a long few months probably since we've seen each other. Um, we've been having a really productive time off, myself and Yeshua. I'm going to start uh, calling in Yeshua, but I'll probably switch into AJ somewhere in there as well because I'm still dealing with my own emotions about being public about that. So. Um, yeah, it's been a really good time off and um, we're really making the most of it in terms of our own emotional work. And Yetra is working really hard to set up a non-profit organisation that will receive the um, sanctuary. Hopefully, we'll see. That's the plan anyway. Uh, in the coming months. Uh, the sanctuary won't be called the sanctuary anymore. It will be called the Learning Centre. And there are many plans afoot already to um, put programs to assist people with learning about what it is to live the divine life path. So we're both um, really excited about that. I'm a little fearful <laughs> uh, because it's getting big. <laughs> and I've known here that our dreams are big and the reason we're here is big, but uh, still in here there's a lot of uh, fear and at times resistance <coughs> to being known, to, uh, to risking, it feels like a risk, to go for a big dream because I still have a lot of sadness about feeling like a dream was once gone for and it was lost. So, yeah, that's what we've been up to. And um, AJ's at home, merrily working on the Learning Centre plans and proposals. So, uh, it's just me here, which feels a little strange. Yeah. Um, I wanted to speak first. Uh, just a little bit, I think, was spoken about yesterday, possibly at the beginning, about um, servants events. <laughs> uh, I had a few reservations. Joy asked me to come and speak today and I said I would love to do that. And then I received an email which led me to a link which was a website that said servantsevents.com and I felt less enthused. <laughs> I, I don't know if the others spoke with you about um, how all of that came about and the emotions that were driving a lot of that. But, uh, yep, I was spoken about, yeah. Um, I just wanted to give you some background from our perspective. Uh, in the middle of last year, AJ and myself decided that there were a number of people who had a desire to serve others and um, who were, at that time, emotionally open to receiving feedback and counsel on their progress on the path. We felt they'd been dealing with their emotions fairly regularly and that they'd demonstrated at that time an, an openness and a willingness to grow further. So we asked a group of those people to attend a series of workshops called Being of Service in the verb sense. <laughs> so what it is to serve another. And the first uh, section of our first course, the first day in fact, was all about humility. And humility in and of itself <laughs> requests nothing of anyone else. It's a willingness to share yourself in vulnerability with others. And it also doesn't demand that we have recognition. It doesn't demand that we need to be seen as a part of a special group. And unfortunately, um, what's happened is because we decided we wanted to take some time off, uh, we did that and so all of our seminars and workshops from that group <coughs> were uh, postponed, shall we say, and the group continued to meet. This was not under our direction uh, and indeed our feedback wasn't requested about that step. The sad thing about that is that obviously um, people stepped out of a willingness to feel <laughs> Not all people, I should say, but there was a general feeling within the group that was driven by their fear, the fear of going it alone to serve other people, and a desire to stay within the group. Sadly, what it also generated is a sense amongst the broader path that somehow now there was a special group of people who were appointed by us, which is not the case at all. Um, both myself and Yeshua have very strong feelings about hierarchy, about elitism, about specialness. Um, and so we did have some concerns about what was happening. Um, 
some of which we expressed and some counsel and feedback was taken which is why this weekend was opened to a broader number of people. Although I wasn't aware that you had to have completed an opening to God workshop before attending because that also to me uh, feels quite um, restrictive and was not my purpose in creating the opening to God workshops to, to make it a bar for someone to have passed. Uh, it doesn't, that's not true? Totally open. Totally open. Awesome. Good news. So, <laughs> that's just a bit of background from us and where we were coming from with the being of service. We didn't feel that it was going to be a select group of people. We wanted to offer that workshop to many people in the future because we do see that many of you have a strong desire to serve uh, and a passion for God and for growth. And these are the things that if we desire to be in service in that way that will demonstrate this path to the world. However, if we have to be very, very humble in that process. As soon as, if we have an unhealed emotion within us that desires glory or fitting in or any of those things, that is going to become the dominating force in, in our service, that no longer is service. And we purposefully call the workshop a being of service because it is not about teaching. <laughs> and many people I know have a desire to teach this path. And what I have learnt is that the only way to truly teach is to live this path. So that was, that was our goal in calling the workshop being of service, that it was a verb rather than a noun, <laughs> as in I, it wasn't a selected or appointed group of people. It was just people that we felt at that time had an openness to growing further. I'm just going to have a drink and then I'll get on to my talk. Does anyone have any questions about any of that? I think it's probably covered yesterday. Um, I know Joy said, he said that it was open to everybody, but a lot of us did get an email from Katrina saying that it was subject to an open to God. This was never subject to an open to God. There was a discussion in that about if we ran the service information later, but nothing, this was never, never like that. So just vague and miscommunication amongst the group as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Alright, it's all very serious and, and I in no way want to diminish the service that has been provided to you here this weekend, which I'm sure you'll all agree it's been a gross experience. And I feel that that is the beauty of this path also. If we're willing to take steps and be humble about the feedback that is given, we're all going to grow, aren't we? And, um, that's the opportunity that's here now for everyone who was part of that group. Okay. Um, I wanted to talk today about fear. Uh, yeah, why would that be? Because I feel like the majority of people on the path at the moment are a bit stuck on fear. And it has been the focus of my last few months, looking at fear trying to understand fear, trying to look at why I wasn't processing fear and eventually now in the last few weeks begin to properly process fear. So um, uh, I'm by no means through my fear, in fact I feel largely in the middle of it and last night I had a bit of a meltdown to Yeshua and I said I can't do it, I'm too afraid <laughs> and he said that's the best time to talk about fear. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I don't feel I've got all the answers about it, but I have learnt a few things about it. The reason I feel like it's also important for people on the path at the moment is that I do feel there's a lot of spirit influence at play um, with quite a number of people that we're having contact with. And that can only occur through our unwillingness either to experience our fear or our unwillingness to let go of anger and arrogance. So um, fear is a big player there as well. And our desire for anger and arrogance is really rooted in our fear anyway. So I feel that it's important that we look at fear and start to get up close and personal with it. <laughs> um, also fear, if you think about it, fear is really the birthplace of control, isn't it? Control in our lives, our desire to control everything is led by fear. 
but it's also the birthplace of prejudice. It's the place where we start to separate and segregate our lives and our friends and the people around us. So it's very divisive fear. We avoid the things, if we let it run us, we avoid the things we're afraid of and we close down our world. And this is what happened for me about a month ago. I'm just going to have another drink. Um, who was at the talk where I talked about the brick wall of terror? Yeah. For those who weren't there, I'll just do a quick revision. <clears throat> so at the time, I'd had a big realisation about addictions. And that was... <clears throat> that was the feeling that all of us exist for most of our lives in a state of addiction. It's like a big mess. Our whole life is run by things we're addicted to. Do you know what I mean by that? Yep, so I want to get nice feelings from men, so I do these things for Klaus. I'm afraid of women, so I avoid women, and I like pander to them, so they're never nasty to me. And in the end, I lose myself completely, and I'm totally in addiction. The only thing that makes me feel good is if when I get approval. So that's where I felt like I'd spent my entire life. It was fairly gutting. <laughs> and really feeling like I don't, I don't know who I am. I'm just a mass of addictions. Beyond that, I had the realisation that AJ had shown up in my life and he'd gone, gee, you're in addiction there and you're in addiction there. Do you realise that's an addiction? <laughs> I've noticed how you're avoiding there. What if, I think you're really afraid there. And, and what I had done for about two years, literally, was one of a number of things. Every time he pointed out I was in addiction, I would, firstly, this was my favourite for about a year, get angry. <laughs> I would project at him. F off, basically. <laughs> I'm fine. Uh, because, uh, we'll get on to because later. Or, I would run away. So, after anger, I got a bit tired and I realised, hey, when I'm angry, it doesn't feel good and I feel like I've been really unloving. And I've never been an angry person before in my life till I met you. You know, what's going on? <laughs> it's never something I desired to have. Um, so after that got old, and it took a long time, let me tell you, I started to run away. <laughs> I broke up with AJ for a while. You know, that's it. I can't do it. I'm not anyone. No, no. And I, I, that was very painful as well, because I was obviously in utter denial of myself and my true desires. Uh, so we got back together, but then I would do an emotional running away. I'd detach, I'd tune out, I'd just sit on the internet mindlessly, or you know, I would run away from reality emotionally. After that got old, then I would do something that is like, uh, I'm sure it's emblazoned somewhere on my soul, that, uh, that I inherited it from my parents at birth um, because of their attitudes. I would self-punish. So I did that fairly well all through all of these other things, but then it became my uh, weapon of choice <laughs> against myself. And it really is very damaging. It's just as damaging as anger at other people, this self-punishing thing. Anyway, so I had this big realisation that every time I did that, I was going, it was like a continuum. Right, here's my fear on the continuum, here's my grief on the continuum, and here's the loving place. So, to get, I, in order to be loving, I had to let go of my fear and my grief, and then I'd be in a state of love with whatever the issue was. I realised that every time um, my addictions were highlighted and I got angry, I ran away, or I self punished, that it was like I was going to the opposite end of the continuum. And up here, there was lots of spirit influence as well that liked to get involved and really muddied the water. And in the end, I would end up self-punishing, I'd realise what I had done, and then I would just feel flat and heavy, and it was all very hard. So I realised this is not the way to go. And the whole reason I'm doing this, the reason I want to go this way, is because this way, there's a big brick wall of terror. And I felt like I can't handle it. 
I really felt like fear is unbearable and I will die if I experience it. So, that was way back when. When did I do that talk? Like September? Bit of a slow learner. Anyway, what, what I really did from September on was that I decided, I made an emotional choice, it was quite large, it was quite a big realisation that I had of this whole process before I did the talk. And at that point I decided that's it. These things are over for me now. Now I still have a propensity for self-punishment, but trust me, it's nothing like it used to be because I refuse to go there. I also decided addictions feel horrible, it's not the real me. And I cut them out to a large degree. I'm not saying I'm free of them, but I really did put some big chunks in my addictive self. So what happened then was, I was left at this point in the continuum. <laughs> and this is where I sat. Right here, going up. There's a big brick wall of terror there. Well, I'm not going back here. That's it. I'm not. I've decided. Emotionally, it was too painful to go back there. So, for a fair few months, I sat here. Going, I'm afraid and I don't want to feel it. I'm afraid and it's constricting my life. I literally, I, I just kept telling myself the truth about what was happening. And I literally began to feel how my fear was like prison bars. It's like, wow. I could go over there, but whoop, I'm afraid. I'm going to go back over here. Or, I'd really like to do that thing, but oh, oh, there's that whole thing with men. I can't do that. And it, it, because I wasn't willing to face, to experience this fear, I began to feel how restrictive my life was. And this has been playing out in my relationship with Yeshua, where I feel very afraid of the picture, who we are, what, in a public sense taking that to the outside world, but even more than that, I'm very afraid of the emotional recognition of who it is I am, inside, for me, inside of me. Um, because there's a lot of grief associated with that, and there's a lot of feelings of having lost something very big, uh, not only in the first century, but even in just being here. Um, and there's a lot of love, actually that I feel that I want to give and a lot of serving that I feel I want to do. And that petrifies me also. Because <laughs> that means not just being in King Roy Community Hall, <laughs> that means something much bigger. Um, and so anyway, this is why I've been sitting here for a long time. Yesha and I, we talked a lot about what's actually going on and I started to own my fear a lot more. I wasn't trying to go, oh, I'm afraid but not very much. I was going, no, Actually, it was like my realisation about how much addiction I had. I suddenly let myself begin to feel how much fear is inside of me. But I still wasn't feeling it. I'm very blocked to fear. And I think predominantly a lot of women are very blocked to fear. And I know a lot of men are as well. But I feel that um, culturally, men are sort of uh, rewarded for challenging their fear, if we say. They're less rewarded for feeling grief. And so a lot of men have a lot of blocks around grief, do they? But women are almost taught to be afraid by their mothers, their dads are saying, be careful of that, you know, you're a woman, you're weak, you need to be afraid. And so women, I feel, we're less, uh, we're less taught to, to confront fear. So it feels so big and unbearable. Just going to have another drink. <coughs> So anyway, things also were heating up with myself and Yeshua, feeling like, well, if I don't go through this fear, we're never going to be close. How can we be close if I don't allow who I really am and allow the grief I have at losing him and losing me? And how am I ever going to actually connect? And this became, this is the other thing I've been focusing on in the last few months, how much I want soulmate connection. I've never felt that before. In fact, I've felt a bit like up yours to the soulmate concept most of my life. <laughs> and it's taken me two and a half years of serious emotional work to realise that's because I desperately, desperately desire it and I feel like it's not going to be possible for me. So, um, 
I'm a bit focusing on soulmate connection and the fact that I'm really afraid. That's been my three months. And I've been reading books and I've been writing and I've been talking and I've been spending a lot of time on my own. I've started to sleep down in the eco tent on my own quite often because of needing to feel this sense of myself, feeling my fears about separation and things like that. So that's what's been happening. And I started to pray, pray a lot. And my, my relationship with God has really strengthened through this process. But what I wanted to share with you today is actually a few things that have happened in the last month that have really helped me begin to start to process fear. And I'm going to call that, I'm going to call that my talk today the parable. You know, the Bible's full of parables here. Yeah? Of. Parable of the Green Tree. <laughs> so to give you a bit of backstory to my parable, for those who don't know or haven't seen, AJ and I sleep in an eco tent, same as uh, Bella and Corny. So it's canvas with a metal frame and floor in it. Also, you should know before I start my story that I love green tree frogs. I think they're cool and cute. <laughs> they're like, I just, I love their colour. I love watching them on the screen, you know, when they're going for the insects. I love how they're, when they're around, you know that the, the land is healthy, you know, there's no pollutants. I, I, I adore them. This is, this is what I've always thought anyway. So, <laughs> I love green tree frogs and I've been spending time sleeping because of my fears, sleeping in the eco tent on my own. So back in December, uh, when we were, AJ was sleeping down in the eco tent then as well, we went away for a while, and when we came home, we found the, the carcass of a little green tree frog inside of our tent. Uh, and we realised he must have got in and he couldn't get out. And so we both went, oh, you know, green tree frog, and took him outside laid him to rest outside um, and then about a month later I was uh, sleeping down in the, in the eco tent on my own this time and I heard this plop, there's like a customary plop as the green tree frog like I don't know where they come from, I think from the metal frame they jumped down and so I realised there was a tree frog in the tent with me and I got up and I looked around and there he was. Oh, he's so cute and I love him. And then I went, I've got to put him outside. Oh, can't touch him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terribly afraid to touch that frog. In fact, no way, I've never touched a frog and it's going to be cold and slimy and I'm like, no. <laughs> and so uh, I was concerned for him though, hey? I thought, what if you can't get out? So I, like I spent about 10 minutes going around the eco tent, finding something that I could put a little bit of water from my water bottle into a receptacle on the ground so that he wouldn't dehydrate inside the eco tent. Because I know they need lots of water. So I did that. It took me about, you know, 10 or 20 minutes. I was talking to him the whole time. Hey mate, you know you really need to come out of here, you know. But and here's some water, it's just there, all that. Anyway, the next morning I went up to the house and I was telling Yeshua. So there was a frog and I couldn't pick it up. So how weird is that? Like I felt really afraid of picking up the frog. But it's okay, like I really love him and I put down um, a saucer of water for him. <laughs> and of course, Yeshua in his customary way looked at me and laughed. And he said, oh, all right, Tom. So that's pretty loving to the frog. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm worried about him. And he said, so what would the most loving thing to do be? And I said, probably put the frog out. And he said, yeah. So you just basically told yourself that you're loving the frog. But the most loving thing to do would be to face your fear, pick up the frog put the frog outside. So this is the first lesson in the parable of the green tree frog. 
It is that my fear can make me believe that I'm being loving. When I'm actually just avoiding my fear. <clears throat> this is a big lesson in fear for all of us. So I thought I was loving the green tree frog when it's, if I wasn't afraid of the green tree frog it would be glaringly obvious to me that I would just pick him up and find him somewhere outside where he could happily live. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? What I put to you is that in our everyday lives there are many issues <laughs> where we decide we're being loving when we're actually just avoiding a fear. And I wanted to tell you about some of the ones that in my life or that I have observed. So in, the, in our months off, in our few months off, obviously uh, Bella and Corny and myself and AJ are all cohabiting, plus the boys come and go. Because Bella, Corny and myself still have a lot of fear about the big picture, at times we get very shut down emotionally and we want to deny who we are. We just operate like Dave, Jody, and Mary, just wandering around. And Yeshua's in the corner, being Yeshua. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that's very uncomfortable for him at times, if you can imagine. Because not only are we just being Dave, Jody, and Mary, we're also projecting at him, could you just please be Alan John Miller? Because frankly, when you're Yeshua, it scares me. So, uh, a couple of months ago, he sat us down. Well, we were talking and um, we decided we should all sit down together and have a talk about this. And he said to us all, you know, you guys, it's really uncomfortable living here because you're, you're all projecting this stuff at me. And I really want to feel my emotions and I really want to express who I am and I want to live in my desires. And, but I'm living with three people who are right at the moment projecting at me heavily to shut down. So it's actually my home and it feels very uncomfortable for me. And all three of us felt mortified. And um, what we decided, all three of us, we were in a pretty resistive place actually, all three of us at the time. We decided, well, it's not loving to project at Yeshua. We should leave. <laughs> that would be a loving thing to do. But that's crap, isn't it? The most loving thing to do would be to cease projecting. Yeah. Which is what we all decided to do. And we're still going through the process of that. It's a daily, it's a daily issue. But that's how you, your fear can make you believe you're being loving when you're actually in deep avoidance. Can anyone think of any other examples in their own life? I've got a few more. What about mums? And I've seen this in a few of the mums in this audience where they feel like, I really love my kids. I want to give them every opportunity in life and I do everything for them and I make sure they have their hobbies and I make them breakfast and I do their laundry and do all of these things and that proves I'm a very loving mother. Does it prove that? Do we know? After the talk we just had, do we feel like that's a loving thing? We're actually crippling our kids from learning how to care for themselves, aren't we? And get, breeding in them a sense of entitlement and an expectation. Sorry, Joy. Yeah, no, I've got an example. Um, uh, can I just uh, draw where the fear is? Yeah. And then I'll, yeah, for sure. So, actually, what do you think the mothers are afraid of? Because there's a fear that's driving that. Yes. And their children getting angry at them. They're afraid of their kids' anger. They're afraid of feeling like they're a bad mum. They're afraid of the lack of approval from their own children. the whole situation and then if their whole identity is invested in being a mum what does that say about them so really there's a lot of fear isn't there but they're saying I'm being very loving 
and yet it's a fear that's driving that whole situation. Joy, you had anything? It's a bit similar, but my daughter's now, I don't know, in her late 30s, 38, I say. And so I've told myself I'm being very loving to her, but what I'm actually ignoring is the damage that I've done earlier in her life, which she's still carrying, which is reflecting back to me. Yep, but it's taken me 18 months on this path to recognise that. To recognise that yeah. she's reflecting to me now is what I'm responsible for. Yep. And so what's your fear that's driving you feeling, wanting to believe that you're loving? Um, the same kind of thing really. Fear that if I'm really going to, um, how, how I've treated my children, in particular my daughter, my own daughter, that, um, that she reject me, I might have that love. Yep. Yep. And it shows all of our addictions, doesn't it, to how much we're invested in like, remember the first statement that Bella and Corny wrote up, and I added that our, our job as parents is to give love to our parents. How many parents actually feel their kids' job is to give love to them? And that's the primary thing that's going on. Yeah, yeah, sure. Lots of men, lots of men on this path feel like they're being very loving with their women, and they, yeah, they can see they've got issues, and they're just hanging in there with them, and, they're doing the best they can and they're going off and just feeling their emotions. And their, their girlfriend or partner has huge amounts of rage. But they feel they're doing the loving thing. They're there for her and they're feeling their own stuff. What, what's the fear that's driving that? What would be the, I should say, what would be the more loving thing to do? If you're living with a woman who's just projecting rage at you all the time. Yeah. You love yourself. And in doing so, that would expose her addiction. What's the fear that stops us doing that? Being alone. Being alone, fear, just fear of the woman's full-on rage projection. <laughs> All of those things, yeah. yeah. So it's very easy to kid ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives that we're being loving when we're actually acting in fear. Okay, the parable continues. So, I agree with Yeshua. I'm like, you're right, that's crap. I'm not loving that frog. And then I went into this space of, well, okay, it means I'm going to have to touch the frogs. <laughs> and it led me down this whole desire to have a big conversation with him about why I would be afraid of frogs. <laughs> so they're slimy, they're cold. What could be the causal emotion that that links to? Like, why would I be afraid of the frog? And I went into this whole thing, uh, and AJ just smiled at me. <laughs> Until the penny dropped, and I went, yeah, my fear will tell me what it's about if I'm willing to surrender to it. My desire, and this is lesson two in the parable, my desire to analyse and understand my fear is just an effort to reduce it. If I can know what it's about going in, maybe I won't be as afraid. So it's actually quite unloving as well. Also, the other trap that a lot of people fall into in this, in this terror-driven analysis is that we become needy. We're like, Helga, can I tell you about my fear? Like, it's, oh, like I'm really afraid of frogs. Can you imagine? Like, what this crazy fear to have, isn't it? I wonder what it would be. Are you afraid of frogs? And suddenly, Helga's got to be a part of my fear. And actually, I can get very needy with Helga to placate my fear. So it becomes a very unloving dynamic. It can also be a way of us getting together if Helga, Klaus and I are all afraid of frogs. We can talk about it, we can commiserate about it. Oh yeah, it's a big one, isn't it? Frogs. <laughs> Most people have got it and uh, we're going to have to deal with it. But gee, it's big, you know, and uh, it can quick... And I've heard many of you have conversations about, not about frogs, but about that are very much along those lines. And it can become a way of justifying our fear. We go, yeah, I've got it, Di's got it, Helga's got it, like this big, okay, frogs. <laughs> you know? <laughs> we need to just talk about it some more, analyse it a bit more, talk about the causal thing that, we're not feeling the causal thing, but I reckon I've figured out what that causal thing is. And this is my theory. And it, fear, fear is really, honestly, our resistance to fear creates a whole other network of conversations and resistances, doesn't it? Alright, I'll just write up the second lesson. So, 
So my fear will tell me what it is. You know, it's scary. 
How can you feel loved? Yeah. yeah. Can anyone else relate that to their life? Yeah. 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 If we're afraid. Like, and also how our fear generates more fear in people around us. When I, when I did the Opening to God workshop, uh, you know, so it was me and there was a group of people who were assisting me and then there was the participants. If I walked in the room totally freaked out, how do you think all the assistants felt? <laughs> oh my God, this is going to be bad, she's so afraid. Oh. And then if we all went into the room with the participants, they all sat there going, oh, this is going to be really fun. <laughs> they didn't know why, they could just feel it in the air. So there's a lot of learning about fear. Keep in mind when I talk about this, this is our projected fear. Remember, I'm still not feeling my fear anywhere through this parable yet. I'm still, like, grappling. I'm still projecting it everywhere. Okay. So, in the end, with this little guy, I got a piece of paper out of my journal, and I got the lamp, and he kind of, like, ended up on the lamp, opened the door, put him out, and he jumped away to freedom. Because in the end, I realised what I was doing to him, and I was like... You're not, the pur your purpose is not an exercise to help me confront fear. <laughs> like, you, I want to love you, and I'm not loving you by, like, <coughs> insisting that I'm going to touch you. So that's what happened. All of these lessons, I'm telling this quite lightheartedly, but this was really a very powerful process for me. Because every lesson that I, every day that we passed, there would be like another lesson. And I realised, because I was praying so much about fear, it was being delivered, you know, in a, in a way that I didn't expect. And um, so I would write in my journal every morning about what it was I was learning. And, and then as the day progressed, I would feel how, man, that's like that. And that's like that. And that's like that. And this is, this is a part of me, like, getting up close and personal with fear, if you like. It was part of me, uh, what it feels like is a process of taming fear coming to understand that fear is just an emotion. Because before then, I felt like fear is reality. Like, I felt like what I'm afraid of is going to happen. That was the emotion inside of myself. And the beautiful thing is that God delivered me a tiny little green tree frog. That, like, hey, if I'm going to think that the reality is I'm going to die if I touch a little green reptile or amphibian, then, you know, it made me really consider, like, what is fear anyway? Like, why? I, I'm so afraid of these big global things. But I'm also petrified of a little frog. And it made me really reflect on what fear was about. Anyway, so lots of other things were happening in my life at this time as well, obviously. And um, a few nights later, I went down to the tent and I've been processing all day. Uh, AJ and I had had a pretty deep discussion about. I can't remember what it was about, but I was feeling really raw and I was feeling really flat. Anyway, I, I, um, I hopped into bed and I would turn out the lamp and I was lying there and I heard this pop. And I was like, you know what, I can't do it tonight. I'm just going to let the frog be there. And in the morning, I'll get up and, and I'll find the frog and I'll put it out. I got up the next morning, I looked everywhere, I couldn't find the frog. I was like, oh, oh they probably can get out if they can get in. Bella and Cordy reckon they have, like, their, their frogs need to meet my frogs because they can get in. <laughs> um, so, so I just left it. I thought, okay, the frog's free. And I went about my day and a couple more nights passed. And one morning I got up and I was uh, going to do up the, the canvas uh, windows in the tent. They go from the floor to the ceiling almost. I got to the third window. And there was this tiny little frog, all dehydrated, and I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> I have avoided my fear, and there's a little frog that's like died because of it. So I was very upset, and I went to get a tissue, because I, I still couldn't pick the darn thing up. I went to get a tissue to pick him up and take him outside. And I was, I was <laughs> very distressed, and as I picked him up, he started to move. I was like, oh my gosh, he's still alive, which brought up even more sort of emotion in me, like, oh, I want to care for this little creature. So I took him outside, there's a tap outside, and I thought, he needs water. So I began to put water on him, and I was sobbing. And um, I sat down to sob about just 
I felt so sorry that this little creature had, had now died because I felt like I was ruining my fear a few nights before. So that was very powerful in itself. But as I was sitting there crying, this huge cloud of midges descended upon me <laughs> and started biting. And, and I'm still like trying to get little bits of water onto the frog, make sure he's okay and sobbing and being eaten by the midges. And what I realised was, I felt like I was feeling sorry about the frog. But what I was actually doing, my old uh, emblazoned on my soul, I was punishing myself about this. So I was crying and beating myself up inside. So here's the next lesson. I'm just going to rub these on there. And the lesson is, I can't release my fear if I'm in a state of self-punishment for having the fear, or if I'm crying about the effects of my fear. Now, many people do this. And again, in my own life, I can relate this to my um, relationship with Yeshua. I feel like I've been growing this huge desire for connection with him and uh, really trying to go for it. And at times, we are connecting, and it's a very beautiful experience. Um, but I've also still got a lot of fear, and I'm beginning to now, after this process, feel some of that fear. But very often, it's still coming out of me. Uh, we were having a discussion just a few days ago. And I was talking about this and, um, and I was crying and I was saying, you know, I just so want to connect with you. I, you know, I feel trapped and I, and I want to have this connection with you. And, and he pointed out quite rightly that I was crying about the effect. What would be more beneficial would be for me to deal with my fear. Otherwise, I'm just crying about something. My tears aren't going to change it because the thing that's blocking our connection is my fear. So, in a way, it's, it's okay to have my grief because that helps me open my longing for him. But in a way, it's wasted. I'm living in an effect because I'm unwilling to confront my fear. Can anyone relate that to themselves? Yeah. Yeah. Anyone want to share anything about that? Okay. So that was very powerful for me as the midges were eating me. I find midges as a good barometer for self-attacking emotions. <laughs> to work. 
If you go out there and put like, I don't know, something very delectable to midges on you and have them come and attack you, I don't think that's very loving either. Someone else Yeah, be careful. See, this is where we're analysing the fear rather than feeling it. So, Lorleen's answer was, I'm afraid of how much damage I've done to her and therefore I'm afraid of what damage has been done to me. Firstly, you're not afraid of how much damage you've done to her. You've done the damage and you weren't afraid when you were doing it. You did it. You're afraid of acknowledging the damage that you've done to her, to yourself emotionally. Now, there may be many, and there are many reasons why you did the damage to her emotionally, but the only way you're going to actually connect to those emotions, and they will relate to damage that was done to you in your childhood, but to say, I'm afraid of the damage I've done to her, firstly, that's not right. The correct statement is, I'm afraid to feel what the damage was that I've done to her. And the second part of that, you said, um, because of the damage that was done to me, now, that's, you're not feeling that state at all, are you? That's just like a logical, it must be because of that. When you, and this is another lesson in the parable. When you go into your fear, it will tell you what's really going on there. And so, it, it's like, sit at the brick wall if you need to. Sit there and say, yep, I'm afraid of that, yep, I'm afraid of that, yep, I'm afraid of that. But when we try and analyse what's on the other side of the wall, it, it, it gets too heady. This is what I've learned about fear. It gets too heady and we're actually just trying to reduce the impact of everything along the continuum. When we're really humble, we just step into the continuum and just like let it all, it will all become very clear. We won't have to use our intellect to understand what's actually happening. Our emotion will tell us. Yeah. And often it's very surprising. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so back to the, uh, by the tap, Midge's attacking. I realised I'm in self-punishment. So I cut that out immediately. And I thought, if I really love this creature, I'm going to minister to it, I'm going to take care of it. And it's going to mean touching it. And that's, that was my next lesson. If I really love something or someone, I will face my fear in order to love them. So that one was big for me in my relationship. How much do I really want to love? <laughs> you know? Because if I don't, like, if I really love, then I'll face my fears. Otherwise, do you know what the truth is? I love my fear more than I love that other thing. My fear is in the driver's seat. My fear is God. My fear is the ruling, the ruling situation. So if I really love, I'm going to touch the, the green tree frog. I'm going to go to the place that scares me the most. So I did. <laughs> And, and that was like, I, I remembered what I had learned the last time when I chased the frog around, how much how damaging that was for the frog. So I went, this poor little frog is captive, he's so weak, he can't really move very much. And I want to move him to like the shelter of a tree where he can rehydrate and, and get better. So I went to touch him, same thing happened. I got there and I was shaking and I was feeling really afraid, felt like I couldn't touch him. I, I moved my hand back and, and I was praying all the time and suddenly I had the guidance. 
I need to soften. I need to soften into this fear. And so I put my hand out and I soften. Instead of going rigid and pushing myself through the fear, I soften. I let myself feel, I'm so afraid, little guy. I'm so sorry. And I picked him up. I picked him up and I put him in, in our old retreat. But that was a really powerful uh, lesson for me in understanding how to process fear. My pattern has always been either to become very rigid when I go into fear, like I've got to do with this, I'm just going to do it, and I'm going to. And like I've travelled a lot, and I've been in, you know. AJ always says, oh, "I can do what you've done. That's very scary, you know, like living in Beirut in the middle of like a coup." And I was like. Fine, you know, it's all it's all hyped in the media. Like that, that's my feelings. But the times when I have been afraid, when I've been backpacking in the, like South America or something, I've gone rigid through my fear. I've gone, no. Nah. My mum taught me this one very well. Get it, get, get through this. Like I'm tough. I'm a woman. I'm going to do it right. And I didn't process any fear in the process. I just got rigid and I got hard with myself. Controlling, yeah, I was very controlling of myself and then in my relationships, controlling of the environment and the man I was with. That helped me, helped me <laughs> deal with fear. The other thing I used to do when I realised this over the last few years, <laughs> that um, being rigid is, doesn't feel like a very feeling state, I would get needy. I would get needy, I would like seek commiseration like I was saying before with Klaus and Helga, like, I want to talk about it. I want, I want, like, I want reassurance for my fear. I'd spend hours talking to Yesha about just it's really a big deal. Like, what we're doing is a very big deal. Look, do you know how much of a big deal this is? Like, this is pretty scary. Like, people could have killed you. Like, the poor man. In the first year of our relationship, the amount of times I said to him, someone could kill you. Uh, it's horrible. It's horrible. But that was me living in my fear and being very needy in my fear for reassurance, and I wasn't dealing with fear. I was just wondering when you're in that stage, are you damaging yourself and him as well? Well, the, the difficult truth for all of us is when we're resisting our emotional state, inevitably it's going to be damaging for ourselves and everyone around us, you know. And just as the converse is true, when we step into a state of truth, that's going to be beneficial to ourselves and everyone around us. Certainly it was damaging for our relationship. I was really pushing him away. It was almost an angry statement of my fear. You could die, you know. So that wasn't, it wasn't loving at all. And if he wasn't so humble and connected with his emotions, he could have felt, well, he did really feel very alienated by that. It was also, uh, in the talk that I did about the brick wall of terror, it was adding bricks to my wall. I was coming up against the fear, going, no, I can't do that, stepping back, another brick on. Coming up, can't do that, stepping back. It just felt like my fear became more and more insurmountable. So the realisation on the morning, being midgy bitten <laughs> with the little poor little sick frog, of realising I need to soften into fear was massive. It's unlocked fear for me. <laughs> Probably all of these lessons have unlocked fear for me because I've begun to see fear as an emotion and I've, I had faith that through this process that I can actually feel fear and in the feeling of the fear, if I'm soft, I can confront the fear. A lot of us have blocks about that because we're told it's quite weak to shake, <laughs> to cry, to look like, like my mum's version of like facing your fear is toughen it out and stepping right in there and being bold and that's not dealing with our fears. It's being rigid and hard on ourselves. The big lesson with fear and with all of our emotions is to learn to have compassion for ourselves. Like we didn't, we didn't damage ourselves. And it's not to blame the people who did, but the truth is damage was done to us. Now, it's also not being a victim. It's just having compassion for the fact like if little Jasper or Lucas came up to me and, you know, said, somebody's just punched me, would I go, well, you're just going to have to tough that out, aren't you? Or, or would I go, you know, oh, well. Is this what happens? You deal with your emotions. No, of course not. I'm saying it comes with hugs, you know, yet you need to feel.
feel what that feels like and I don't want to take that away for you. For you. But I'm going to love you through this process. And this is what a lot of us are avoiding in our processing. We've been taught to be tough, we've been taught to rigid, like tough it out and be rigid. And the key to dealing with fear is to soften. Gently put them on a piece of paper, took them outside. They were so happy with the arrangement. I was so happy with the arrangement. I no longer was freaking out that they were going to jump on me. If they jumped on me, that was okay. They could feel I was relaxed. They were like, okay, where are we going? And it's a joke now. It's like a little taxi ride out of the tent that I give them every night. <laughs> so that was the next part of the lesson, I suppose, was that when I deal with my fear, everything around me feels less afraid as well. So the converse of the earlier lesson, which was when I live in fear, everyone feels more afraid. When I soften into and experience my fear, everything like feels more relaxed with me. So yeah. That taught me that my fear is not a real thing, as I alluded to earlier. So while you asked, did my fear completely dissolve? No, but what I did realise is what I'm afraid of isn't a reality. You know, so yes, I can still feel a bit afraid to do things or many things I still have a fear about, but I can now begin to feel like this is just another emotion, like grief or anger. This is just my fear. I felt quite afraid before I came up here today and I just sat with it and went, instead of getting rigid, instead of toughing, instead of like reading my notes maniacally, I was just like, no, I'm just afraid. I'll just let myself feel that. And I know it's not a reality. Like. I know you're all not going to attack me or, you know, it's just my fears of things in the past. A him? Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's a family trait to call a nondescript, like a non-sex uh, animal a he. Yeah. yeah. somebody else was in charge of. We felt that we had to believe what adults said to us. Now we're grown women. Can you see, even with that fact of our physical size, there is, there's a change in the reality. We're also, for a lot of us, feeling our emotions. So that helps us like feel what the emotional context is that we're in. And if we feel like there's someone who's uh, threatening, or if we're like in a pub where there's a bar fight or something, we'll go, I'm going to remove myself. This is not logical to stay in a situation that's so unlovely. So it's very unlikely that we would be, we can't be abused in the same way we were when we were children. 
and the desire, like many, many, many women who have been abused in their childhood cling to that idea. That's it, it's going to happen again. I can't feel the fear of that because it's going to happen again and I need to hold on to the fear in case it happens again so I know it can't happen again. The truth is, while we hold on to the fear inside of us, it only, as we know, amplifies the law of attraction. When we soften into the fear, when we feel weak, when we feel powerless, when we feel violated, it feels traumatic, yeah. That's why we've kept it under wraps for a long time. But the truth is that makes us more emotionally sensitive. It makes us know that if we're talking to a man, there might be spirit influence. If we're very open emotionally, we're going to feel that immediately. It, it will help us be more in touch with our guides. Where am I going to go? What's going to happen? It will help us to love ourselves more. So we won't be in situations where people are being unloving to us. Because we'll have healed this feeling of unworthiness that was created in us through the abuse. And we'll know I'm worthy of love. And this doesn't feel that loving. I'm just going to leave now. So the truth is, the things that we're very afraid of, it's very unlikely that they'll happen again. Linda? I'm stepping in the piano. Yeah. Um, I just thought I, I could probably share an example that I've experienced that will help to illustrate your point. Lovely. Yep. Um, when I, I didn't know that I'd been sexually abused until I started processing. I live with my soulmate and have done for 30 years. And we have a very, very close bond. And I knew that at some point in time he would find out the truth. And I was very afraid of stepping in and telling him because I was afraid of his rejection. But you know, and there have been a couple of emotions like that that I've processed that really affected that soul connection. And each time I was afraid of, of what his reaction would be. But each time I found the courage to step in and just say, I need to tell you something, I need to share something with you. And the love that I felt back from him each time was just like overwhelming each time. It was and it's just helped our relationship grow more and more each time. And it's just it's it's like that having having the courage to step into your fears and you know, I stand there and I beat myself up about it, about my fear, and I can't do this, and oh my God, he's going to reject me, and he's going to hate me for this, and you know, how's he going to feel? And, and then I, I actually say what I need to share with him, and it's exactly the opposite to what I had been fearing every single time. Yeah. And it's grown our, our relationship so much more. So, That's just, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Because that has been my experience also, like sharing uh, a lot of my sexual history from this life with Yeshua. I have felt like the, uh, he's going to reject me completely. This, I'm so ashamed, all of these things. And of course, that's my fear of things that happened in the past where I was rejected, where I was judged. And for yourself, being abused, that's a huge rejection of who you are. And But when we step into the fear, we recognise, oh, that fear belongs in the past. Yeah. That's attached to an older grief. And actually, it's not the reality right here. Yeah, yeah. And the, it is so, I can relate to the feeling of overwhelming um, gratitude, love, openness, sort of, uh, to be loved in that very vulnerable space is beautiful. Yeah. Very nice. Okay, so the next lesson was that fear is not real. past is quite real, but our fear, our fear of what's happening now, is very often just the resistance to the grief. So that nearly is the end of my parable. Yeah. I guess the last thing was that I learned was that, um, so now I'm, I'm happily cohabit with the frogs. I get them out, we still have chats, it's all like I feel lots of more love for the frogs. 
Um, but the last thing that I, I realised when I was writing this story, actually, was that God always delivers. God, I was praying about my fear, and oh man, did God deliver <laughs> in a beautiful way. And I just wanted to remind you all of that. Like, if you're humble in this process and you sincerely pray, God's going to deliver to you what you need to do with these things. You have to keep a seeking heart, though. Yeah, keep seeking. The thing that happens when we're afraid very often is that our heart closes. We go, many of you at the moment are very afraid of Yeshua. Uh, that's the truth. <laughs> People even come to our door now and go, oh, I'm really afraid to be here. <laughs> if, you, if you made us into like the green tree frogs in that scenario, how do you think we feel? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's, really like, cool. it's hard to feel loved when people go, I'm terrified of you. <laughs> um, but the, one of the reasons, uh, and I think I can speak on his behalf, that Yeshua has, is maintaining our break is that he feels that many of you have received a lot of truth already. Some of it has been universal truth, some of it has been quite personal. And you're now quite afraid to receive any more. And that means your hearts have closed towards him. Your hearts have almost closed towards the path. To think about it. Because the thing that brought you to this path was it not worth seeking. It was an inquisitiveness about God's universe, about what it was all about. And that opened you to discover truth. And truth came. And you loved it. And it was amazing. And then it got pretty intense, didn't it? <laughs> and there was a lot of emotion stirring you. And many of you now feel afraid of what's the next thing that's going to be stirred in me. And I wanted to point it out while we're talking about fear that this is a big issue for a lot of you on the path and it's going to make moving along the path, if you like, moving along the continuum is quite tricky. If you start, if you're living in your fear, if you let your heart close, uh, not only can Yeshua not give you any more truth, but the law of attraction is greatly restricted. Do you know what I mean? You know, you, you're not going to, you're not going to think, you're going to think, what is tree from? I hate them. I used to love them, now I hate them. I could have gone down that track, couldn't I? But instead I was like, oh, I'm afraid. I'm, not, I'm afraid of this situation. And what, what is God trying to teach me in this situation? But I needed to have an open, seeking heart for that to happen. So that's something that I wanted to leave you with, was this idea of having an open, seeking heart.